Good afternoon and welcome to Ask the Expert campaign, session four, conducting a self skin exam check and the ABCDs of melanoma. My name is Cassie Beisel and I'm the Senior Advocacy Officer with the Melanoma Research Foundation. I am also a three-time cancer survivor, one of those being melanoma. The Melanoma Research Foundation is the largest independent organization devoted to melanoma committed to support of medical research in finding effective treatments and eventually a cure for melanoma, the MRF also educates patients and physicians about prevention, diagnosis, and the treatment of melanoma. The MRF is an active advocate for the melanoma community, helping to raise awareness of this disease and the need for a cure. The MRF website acts as a premier source for melanoma inf information seekers across the country. If you visit melanoma.org, you'll be able to access our free education materials. First, I'd like to highlight our partner at DermTech. DermTech is partnering with the Melanoma Research Foundation to host our first Ask the Expert series this year, which has occurred throughout the month of January. This final session will focus on the ABCDs and Es of melanoma and what to look for when conducting a monthly preventative skin checks at home and will be presented by Dr. Julie Karen at Complete Skin in New York City. Dr. Karen is a board certified dermatologist who specializes in Mohs micrographic surgery, laser surgery, skin cancer, and the treatment of leg veins. Dr. Karen received her medical degree from the wet uh, excuse me, the Whale Medical College of Cornell University, where she was elected to Alpha Omega Alpha, the National Medical Honor Society. She completed her residency training in the Ronald O. Perlman Department of Dermatology at New York University Medical Center, where she served as chief resident and received the Morris Later Award for Excellence in Dermatology. Dr. Karen completed a procedural dermatology fellowship at NYU and Memorial Sloan Kettering. Dr. Karen is certified by the American Board of Dermatology. She is also a fellow of the American Academy of Dermatology, the American College of Phlebology, the American Society of Dermatologic Surgery, and the American Society for Laser, and Medic Laser Medicine and Surgery. She is affiliated with the New York University Langone Medical Center, where she is a clinical assistant professor of dermatology and teaches surgery to dermatology residents. Dr. Karen is a Castle Connolly top doctor and was again elected to the New York Super Doctors in 2020, which appears in the New York Times Magazine. Dr. Karen has published numerous articles and chapters in the field of dermatology, including publications in the New England Germ Journal of Medicine, Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, and Archives of Dermatology. Our partners at DermTech, who are sponsoring this month-long series, are leading genomics company in dermatology and are creating a new category of medicine, precision dermatology, enabled by their non-invasive skin genomics platform. DermTech's mission is to transform dermatology with their non-invasive skin genomics platform to, to access to high level quality dermatology care and improve the lives of millions. DermTech provides genomics analysts, analysis of the skin, samples collected non-invasively using an adhesive patch rather than a scalpel. DermTech markets and develops products that facilitate the early detection of skin cancers and is developing products that assesses inflammatory disease and customized drug treatments. The MRF knows that education is critical for patients making informed decisions about their care. That is why we are thrilled to partner with DermTech on our Ask the Expert series, which aims to launch, which, um, pardon me, which aims to touch on topics that help educate and empower the melanoma community. Today is our fourth and final session in this series. We encourage people to use the comments section to ask questions which will be addressed at the end of today's session. Please note that the information presented during today's session is for educational purposes and any treatment questions should be directed to your healthcare provider. We would encourage everyone to visit melanoma.org to utilize our free resources like our treatment center finder or a clinical trial finder, 
We also have a free Ask the Nurse service where patients can connect and ask questions. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Karen for her presentation. Dr. Karen? All right, thank you so much, Cassie. It's my absolute pleasure and honor to be here talking about what I consider um, the most important component of um, what I do as a dermatologist. As you mentioned, I am uh, in practice in New York City. I actually practice alongside my sister. And together we have a practice called Complete Skin MD, where we do focus on a variety of procedures, skin cancer surgery, laser, and aesthetics, but at least half of what we do is dedicated to the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of melanoma. And we take this extremely seriously. And again, it is my honor to uh, help to educate the public on behalf of the MRF, um, whose work is really extraordinary. And of course, to partner with DermTech, and we'll speak a little bit about that later as well. So I'm gonna start with just a broad overview of skin cancer, but I will really spend the majority of my time focusing on the most important form of skin cancer because although it is not the most common, it is the most dangerous, and if it's neglected, it can turn deadly, melanoma. So skin cancer happens to be the most common form of cancer in the United States with well over 5 million new cases being diagnosed in the United States each year. It is known that there will be more new cases of skin cancer than of breast, prostate, lung, and colon combined. One in five Americans will develop some form of skin cancer at some point in their lifetime. The three most common forms of skin cancer are basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and then melanoma. Briefly, basal cell, because it is so common, it is important for the public to be educated on what sort of signs you, and symptoms you might look for. Classically, this lesion will occur in a chronically sun-exposed area and will manifest as a pearly papule, meaning a bump that has sort of a translucent shine to it that often has a slightly elevated or rolled border, as you see in these two lesions, and a center that may be crusted and slightly indented relative to the periphery. As this lesion enlarges, you may notice the appearance of fine vessels coursing throughout the lesion. These are called telangiectasias. And with further growth, this will lead to easy bleeding or what we consider friability or fragility of the lesion. Here's some other clinical examples where you see the evidence of these fine vessels that are tree-like in that they arborize, form branches of a tree coursing throughout the, the lesion. The one on the left side, when you look at the screen, does have some pigment in the lesion, but the majority of these are devoid of pigment. However, you can see basal cells that are both pearly and have some brown or black components to them. Often, as I said, with time, these lesions will bleed, ooze, or crust. So if you have what you think is an acne lesion, but it's just not healing or a sore that just won't go away, you should give consideration to the fact that it may need medical attention. When neglected and only when neglected for a long time or in patients with severe underlying immunosuppressive issues, basal cell can take on these gruesome appearances, but thank goodness, the vast majority of lesions are caught well before this time due to increased awareness and patient seeing physicians regularly. The second most common form of skin cancer is squamous cell carcinoma. It is the most directly correlated with chronic sun exposure. And also there are some other risk factors which include cigarette smoke, um, similarly, patients who have long-standing burn injuries or maybe had HPV infections, which is the virus that causes warts in individuals, can also be at greater risk of developing squamous cell. Relative to basal cell, these have a higher metastatic potential, so they are of intermediate concern in the spectrum of skin cancers. But again, they tend to be much less you know, aggressive than melanoma. So these are some examples of how squamous cell may look, and these are two common areas of chronically sun-exposed areas, the helix or the top of the ear, the lower lip, which is often not protected from the sun. And you see these crusted, keratotic, meaning scaly, rough lesions. They may bleed, they may be sore, they may be completely asymptomatic. Early on, they may even be mistaken for a rash. Um, if someone has eczema or psoriasis and they have a scaly patch or plaque that just isn't going away with standard therapy, you should consider, again, seeing a dermatologist to have a biopsy. And 
as with basal cell, but even much more so if neglected and particularly in immunosuppressed patients, they can progress and become very, very severe. And you would never wanna let your lesion or that of your family member get to this. Now moving on to malignant melanoma, which is although it's the third most common form of skin cancer, it is the one for which partnering with the public, with our patients, aiding in early detection is most critical because sometimes these lesions can progress very rapidly and even seeing your physician once a year may not be enough if you have a lesion that could be a melanoma that's rapidly changing. Melanoma is increasing greatly in incidence with a 700% increase in the past five decades. In 1930, the lifetime risk was one in 2,500, and that has been reduced last decade to one in 50 Americans. And that is definitely, we think, increasing over time. It is the sixth most common cancer in the United States. Um, of the seven most common cancers, it is the only one whose incidence is increasing. During the first few decades of life until age 39, women are almost twice as likely to develop melanoma than men, but thereafter the incidence in men surpasses that in women and that carries on until the later decades of life. So several years ago, the NYU Melanoma Cooperative Group got together and they came up with this very helpful, not perfect, but very, very helpful mnemonic about how we can educate the public, lay people, our patients, our friends, our family, about self-diagnosis or self-suspicion you know, suspicion of something that might be a melanoma. And so I urge you all to you know, listen to this, try to commit it to memory, spread the word when you can, because it really can be so important. The mnemonic is called the ABCDEs of melanoma. A stands for asymmetry. These two lesions depicted in this slide are both melanomas and they demonstrate this asymmetry that I'm speaking of. If you were to cut a line down the center of this lesion in any direction, the two sides do not match completely in color, shape, or border. Benign moles much more commonly are benign. B stands for border irregularity. Benign moles, again, very often have a very well circumscribed, almost circular or perfectly round um, border, and you can easily uh, delineate it with a pen or a marker, whereas these lesions have a much more indistinct border. It's scalloped or jagged, or sometimes it's blurry or hard to make out. So border irregularity is also a feature of many melanomas. C stands for color variability or variation. Within a single lesion, we often are reassured when the entirety of a lesion is one color. When you see a lesion that has multiple shades of brown, brown, black, dark brown, medium brown, red, blue, white, pink, multiple shades within a single lesion, you have to suspect that this lesion is less organized and therefore more likely to be atypical or possibly a melanoma, as you see in these two atypical lesions. D is a little bit controversial among the ABCDEs, but it has some relevance for sure still, and so we speak to it. D stands primarily, or at least in its initial form, for diameter. Um, what I say to patients is, if you have a lesion that is larger than your other lesions, pay closer attention as that lesion may be more likely to be atypical or to be a melanoma. But by no means should you not be concerned about a lesion because it is very small, as melanomas often when they first form can be small. The cutoff that we point to is that of a pencil eraser, about six millimeters in diameter. And it is prudent if you have multiple lesions that are greater than six millimeters in diameter to take note of them, to be aware of what they look like at baseline, because these are the ones that are slightly more likely to change, um, become malignant, although this is definitely not always the case, as I said. D also, increasingly, we wonder, should maybe stand for dark. Not all melanomas are dark and not all dark moles are melanoma, and particularly in individuals who have darker constitutive pigmentation, like those with you know, ethnicities that have more pigment in their skin, they may make moles, excuse me, sorry. They may make moles that um, are darker in general. But if you have a lesion that is darker than all your others, an ugly duckling of sort, it stands out because in contrast to your other moles, which may be medium brown or light brown, it is much darker. It is important to pay close attention and to have that lesion detected. But here you can see that these lesions, which were in fact melanomas, are much smaller than a pencil eraser. The ruler depicts that they are about two and a half to three millimeters in diameter. So if you went solely by diameter, you would have missed this early melanoma. E, perhaps most important of all, is evolution. 
recent change, ongoing change needs prompt attention. At a certain point, once we're in our 30s and 40s, the rate at which we develop new moles substantially diminishes and it's unlikely to get many new moles. Similarly, the moles that you've had, unless they are you know, directly traumatized, they should not be changing. They certainly shouldn't be growing, changing in size, color, shape. Their border shouldn't be changing. If you detect evolution, please do not ignore that. You're never being overly careful. Call your dermatologist and go have the lesion checked out. So what are risk factors for melanoma? Well, increased risk is definitely associated with some genetic factors, fair skin, light hair, light eyes, certainly a personal or family history of melanoma. Um, yes, there is a genetic component to melanoma, but it is not, most melanomas are not attributable to a single gene. It's the interplay between a genetic predisposition and UV exposure and other environmental exposures that leads to melanoma. But if you have a family with many melanomas, you should be suspicious that your family may very much be a, predis a predisposition and you should make sure you're checked extra regularly. Additionally, sun exposure. I mentioned that squamous cell carcinoma is much more likely in the setting of chronic, prolonged, cumulative sun exposure, such as that would occur over many decades. Melanoma has a slightly different pattern of sun exposure that comprises the risk. We call this sunburst exposure. The majority of melanomas, although there are always exceptions to the rule, occur in areas that are generally protected from the sun, but have had a few spouts of intermittent intense sun exposure. So very commonly in women on the lower legs, most of the year the lower legs are covered, especially if you're living in the Northern Hemisphere um, or not near the equator, are covered with pants. But in the summer, you may not be very careful about protecting your lower legs. With men, it tends to be the shoulder, upper back, and trunk. Most of the year, these areas are covered. But when the sun is shining, these areas are predisposed to getting acute intermittent sunburns. And it's that acute intermittent sun exposure that really greatly increases one's risk of melanoma. You can get melanoma on your face just as you can get squamous cell on your face. You can get all skin cancers everywhere, even where the sun doesn't shine, but the greatest risk factor is intermittent intense sun exposure. Additionally, if you're someone who has numerous moles, whether they are homogenous and benign appearing, and certainly if they're atypical, but that too will increase your risk of melanoma. And you know, hopefully this is going to one day become a thing of the past, but the use of sun tanning devices, which emit high power UVA radiation, definitely is a risk factor for melanoma. And many of us think that we can attribute the increased risk of melanoma among young women to, you know, decades of improper, what I consider improper use of sun tanning devices. A few other specific risk factors. Um, this is some data that the Skin Cancer Foundation has published. More than five sunburns at any age doubles the risk of melanoma. A single blistering sunburn in childhood or adolescence doubles your risk of melanoma later in life. And as I mentioned, if your first exposure to tanning beds is in your youth, you increase your melanoma risk by 75%. So please do not visit tanning beds. So, you know, it's usually we have sufficient data to convince our patients, maybe even scare them about the importance of sun protection. But sometimes, particularly in young individuals who have never had a problem with their skin, maybe no one in their family has ever had skin cancer, maybe they just love the way that the sun feels, as we know, do know that it does release endorphins and can have addictive potential. We sometimes need to appeal to patients' vanity to further get them motivated about protecting their skin. And so while it's a far less important message, it still is one of great relevance and that appeals to young women in particular. While up to 90% of skin cancers are associated with UV exposure, what else does UV exposure do? Well, we know that up to 90% of visible skin changes that we attribute to aging, wrinkles, abnormal texture, fine lines, deeper lines, blotchy pigmentation, altered tone, 90% of these are also the result of prolonged skin, ex uh, skin exposure, sun exposure, excuse me. So let this be an extra motivating factor to wear sunscreen every single day. So what are some you know, myths or other sun facts that I think is important for you to know? Well, despite what you may think, even on a cloudy day, 80% of the sun's UV rays pass through the clouds. The UVA, which is the long wavelength rays that are more implicated in the development of melanoma, they do also cause tanning, but that is not, you know, that's just for you to know, not a good thing. I'm not purport purporting that. But 80% of UVA rays will penetrate through the clouds and still inflict damage on our, uh, on our skin, even if we're not necessarily feeling the intense effects of the sun. 
Furthermore, UV radiation from the sun has very potent reflective powers. If you're on sand, it's 17%. So you're getting a double dose. You're getting that UV radiation when it first hits your skin. Then once it reflects off the sand and bounces back onto your body. Snow even more so. And this is a huge you know, important um, under, thing for skiers to understand that you get 80% re-reflection off the snow. So you're getting that dose almost two times what you do. Furthermore, you're at higher altitudes. And so in general, the sun and its UV radiation is more powerful. Concrete also reflects um, the sun greatly somewhere in between these two percentages. So what are some other myths? Well, so often I will hear from my patients, particularly those who are middle-aged or beyond, what's the difference? Why am I gonna bother protect myself anymore? All the damage is already done. And we did used to believe this. We used to thought that by, think by age 18, the vast majority of sun damage had been accrued. But study has actually informed us that by age 18, we've only had less than actually a quarter of our lifetime exposure. Each decade thereafter, we get another 10% of our UV exposure. So taking precaution, protecting yourself at any age is the smart thing to do, and it will impact your further risk of skin cancer. Furthermore, we talked about cloudy days, but also winter days, UVA, which is the longer wavelength. And again, that wavelength most intensely implicated in the development of melanoma is present year round. And furthermore, it can penetrate through glass windows. So if you have an office or you're working from home these days and you have nice lighting, that's wonderful, but you have to wear sunscreen even indoors or you will increase your risk of skin cancer and photo aging. So what are some measures you can do? Well, basic measures include use of a broad spectrum sunscreen, ideally with an SPF of 30 or higher that you apply at least 20 minutes before going outdoors. It should basically, depending on how much you're exposing of your skin, dictates how much you should use. And it's much more than you probably think. On a typical fall, winter, or even spring day when you're just walking to work, yes, of course you can just do the exposed areas. But if you're planning on spending the day at the beach, by the pool, or exercising outside, you need to cover all of your exposed skin. And on average, uh, one shot glass, one ounce, the size of a golf ball is the amount needed to adequately cover the exposed areas of the body. Furthermore, one single application is not going to be enough. You will get tan. So often patients come in after vacation and I, you know, sort of give them a hard time about their suntan. They say, oh, but I put on 50. But really what they mean is they took a little squirt of 50, applied it, and then spent the day out in the sun. And this is not nearly giving you that SPF 50 protection that's stated on the bottle. It is being substantially diluted because you're not using enough. And furthermore, after two hours, it's essentially down to zero. But sunscreen is just one component of sun smart behavior. You also should avoid peak hours of sunlight. 10 to 4 is classic, but we are finding these days um, 9 to 5, 5.30, you can still get sun damage. So you want to really be careful when the sun is high. Wear protective clothing, especially for young kids. Sun protective clothing does not need to be reapplied. It's labeled UPF, and that protection factor, which is very often a 50, is maintained through multiple clothes washing. And it really limits how much you have to fight in reapplying the sunscreen and gives you sustained durable protection. And I am a huge proponent of sun protective clothing for outdoor activity and especially for children. As I sort of said before, but please never patronize tanning salons. These new high pressure sun lamps emit huge doses of UVR, much more potent than that of the sun. And we talked about how particularly when that first exposure is you know, before age 35, you greatly increase your risk of melanoma. Never work on a tan. Tanning is the body's response to injury. It's your body's way of saying, all right, I'm having damage to my DNA. I better thicken and darken to protect myself from further damage. There is no such thing as a healthy tan. And then with respect to diagnosis of melanoma and all forms of skin cancer, examine your skin and that of your loved ones regularly. This you know, image sort of depicts the ideal way to do it. Once a month, it really doesn't take long at all once you've done it a couple of times. After you get out of the shower, before you get dressed with anything on, use a full length mirror with the aid of a handheld mirror. Look at your entire body in an ideal world. Um, you even could use a partner and document any moles that are larger or just look, you know, have any of the A, B, C, D, E's of melanoma. I really recommend using your smartphone or, you know, some other device to take a photograph to document these lesions because we say, you know, very often patients say, oh, my last dermatologist told me to watch this, but they don't remember what it looked like before. If you don't have an image of what it looks like, these lesions do often change subtly, and sometimes it's slowly, sometimes it's rapid. But if you don't have a baseline image, you're not going to detect subtle change, and that's the stage at which we want to diagnose melanoma is when lesions just start to change. 
So again, record your spots if you can. Um, I really think photo documenting is the best, best way to do it. And then if you notice anything changing or suspicious on yourself or someone that you care about, see a dermatologist promptly. And one reason that some people don't see dermatologists is because they may be needle phobic. Perhaps they've had bad you know, experiences in the past where they've been scarred up with multiple biopsies and maybe they all did check out okay, so now you've sort of lost faith in the process. But DermTech, the company that you heard Cassie speak of earlier, um, has really changed the face of melanoma diagnosis by introducing what we call genomic assay. Basically, by utilizing these four smart patches that you see on the left side of your screen, applying them to the lesion and sending those four patches off for examination by a laboratory, um, genetic material can be detected from the lesion. And what they do is they test, depending on what state you're in, um, but they test for the presence of two or three genes that are known to be associated with melanomas. And if none of those genes are being expressed by the lesion, there's a very, very good chance that this lesion is in fact benign. It has a between 91 and 97% sensitivity and a 99% negative predictive value. And it allows us to not ignore the lesion, but comfortably watch it for any change, but with extra concrete data that the lesion at a certain point in time is genetically behaving in an innocuous way. Conversely, if one of the two or three genes that are being tested is being detected, in almost every instance, your dermatologist will recommend a biopsy of that lesion as the risk of melanoma increases substantially. It has been shown and corroborated in numerous, numerous studies that DermTech pigmented lesion assay, PLA as it is called, can enhance diagnosis. It improves our ability to detect melanomas at a much earlier stage. And it also can help us avoid unnecessary biopsies, which again, may be a reason that many people sort of avoid the dermatologist, but I urge you not to do that. I use it almost every day in my practice and not, oh, I do use it every day in my practice. And I don't want to get um, too scientific here, but if you just take a moment to look at this, what this slide is showing is that there are stages to the development of melanoma. The first incident is the UV radiation inflicting damage on the skin. You get these hotspot driver genetic mutations followed by gene expression, and then you start to see changes under the microscope or visible to the naked eye. So what this means is that if we utilize the smart patch, the PLA test wisely, we can catch those melanomas at a much earlier stage and that will translate into greater survival and really you know, decrease the burden of this too often deadly disease. As I said, there's been a lot of recent you know, noise about term tech. There's been third party clinical validation most relevantly, just in the past you know, week or two, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which is basically a well-validated um, consortium that advises on the clinical detection, um, treatment, and prevention of the most common skin cancers, has validated that the DermTech PLA can and should be used to aid in the diagnosis of early melanoma. So this is just an example of how it can be useful. Here it was a young, beautiful, and also pregnant patient who came into my office. This lesion is small. You can see it is much smaller than a pencil eraser. She really didn't want to have the biopsy. She had healed poorly from biopsies in the past. She wasn't too concerned about the lesion. I didn't like it. She was pregnant. There were a million reasons she didn't want to have the biopsy, but I did perform the DermTech PLA. And it came back positive. One of the two genes at that time that were utilized in the test was expressed. And I did a biopsy and the lesion came back just, just the stage of turning into an early insight to melanoma. Needless to say, she was grateful, I was grateful. And you know, if I had watched that lesion for three months, um, we don't know what would have happened. It may have still been very early, but maybe she would have forgotten to follow up. Maybe it would have you know, become aggressive. So it's really a very useful tool again, and can help us to partner with our patients to make them more comfortable with skin checks. So I'll take any questions now and thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Karen, for providing our community with a thorough overview of what to look for when conducting a self-skin check at home. We will now be taking questions from our viewers in regard to your presentation and would like to thank our viewers for their submissions. We'll try to get to all questions, but if we're not able to, please know that we will follow up. So Dr. Karen, first question. Should sunscreen be worn throughout winter months and what SPF would you recommend? 
Sure. So thank you for that question. Um, I'm happy to answer that. Absolutely is the answer. You should wear sunscreen all year round. Just make it part of your daily routine. Keep it near where you brush your teeth and then you will never forget it. There's multiple reasons for this. Number one, you can be surprised. Sometimes you end up spending many more hours outside than you anticipated. As I mentioned, even on cloudy winter days, the UVA radiation that's implicated in the development of melanoma and photoaging of the skin is present and it's penetrating through clouds, through winter skies. It may not feel that hot, but it is there and it is causing damage. What SPF, I would say if you, you know, I, I usually just say find a 30 plus that you like and stick with it because you don't need to go down from a 30, um, but you can definitely use a 15 or a 20 in the winter months. Um, but the truth is, is that if anything, we need more moisturizer during the winter months. So if you find a, a product that you like, no need to, to go to a lower SPF, but yes, you could go and get away with a 15 in the winter months, but every single day, I do not leave home without it. Great. Uh, here's another one who asked, um, you know, you mentioned earlier about uh, melanoma having some hereditary traits to it. Um, so the question is, is mel melanoma hereditary, but also what is generally the percentage that you would say that it is hereditary? So it does depend on how you define hereditary. 10 to 20 percent of, of melanomas are attributable to a genetic defect that runs within families, a specific identifiable defect. But the, the remaining 80 percent, although they may not be attributable, at least not to a known gene defect, I still think they are genetic in part in that the risk factors, light hair, light skin, light eyes, um, you know, those all are genetic features, and though they are not a singular gene, they also increase your risk. So I would say most people that I diagnose melanoma in do not have a family history of melanoma yet. So maybe that's a helpful, you know, like, you know, um, baseline to think about, but at least 10 to 20% do run in families. And as we see melanoma increase, it's possible if you account for genetics with other risk factors that are inherited that that percentage is higher. And let me ask one more question regarding um, sunscreen before we move on to some questions about the actual um, germ tech biopsy. But is sunscreen recommended on your hands while driving, especially during long drives in the summer months? Absolutely, especially on the, in the summer months during long drives. But even if you're spending a lot of time in your car adjacent to a window, even on the winter months, if you all haven't seen it, I don't have time to pull it up and share it right now, but I urge you, if you Google sun damage, a uh, truck driver, 28 years, you will see this profoundly impactful image of a man who spent decades as a truck driver. And you can see how the left side of his face looks at least 20 years older than the right side of his face. And that we all attribute to the fact that he had UV exposure. You know, maybe sometimes his window was open, but I'm sure much of the time the window was closed. So yes, long drives, that glass, unless you have UV, protect UV protective glass on your cars, which you have to generally get a medical note for. So most people do not have that. You definitely want to think about the exposure you're getting in long car rides and on airplanes too. Great, wonderful. I do want to give you just a, a kudos. We have here in the comment, awesome presentation, Dr. Karen. So just wanted to make sure you got that note. Um, so a question here is, derm is the derm tech test available for use at home? Very good question. And this, if you would ask me that question um, prior to the COVID pandemic, which we are all amidst right now, the answer would have been no, not yet, but you know, we, we all as physicians and as medical you know, providers had to adapt to change. And when there was you know, several months where people simply were not going into physicians, um, DermTech sort of adapted their protocol and they did make it available for at-home use. And I still will occasionally for patients who, again, are very fearful of leaving their home and coming into the office um, or for a number of other reasons cannot come in. If there's a suspicious lesion, I will counsel, um, you know, we can arrange with DermTech to have the kit FedEx to your home. Um, your ordering physician or one of their staff members will talk you through how to administer the test. It really is very, very simple. There's also an online tutorial that um, you can watch. And then there is a pre, um, there's an enclosed uh, prepaid return package that you can send back and you get the results within certainly two weeks, usually within one week. So it's, you know, it really should be done under physician supervision, but it can be done at home. Okay, great. And I think we have time for just two more questions. Um, so the first one is going to be, uh, is non-invasive testing, so is this Dermtech non-invasive testing available at all dermatologists across the country? 
not yet. If it was up to me, um, and I'm sure up to Durham Tech it would be, um, I, it's increasingly being used. It's getting you know increased um, awareness, publicity. It's inclusion in these NCCN guidelines that I spoke of. I'm sure will have a very important impact on sort of how widespread it is. But no, it is not currently used. Um, I'm sure you could reach out to Durham Tech and they could help you find a physician in your neighborhood or community that does use it, but not, not every physician uses it yet. Last question is, uh, Dr. Karen, could you explain why it's important to find melanoma as early as possible? That's a great question. Absolutely. So um, we know that 99% of early melanomas are 100% curable with a simple skin surgery. Early melanoma means that the lesion is generally confined to the very, very upper layers of the skin. It has not yet invaded the dermis, which is the second layer of the skin. And therefore, those cells that are malignant do not yet have any access to the blood or lymphatics, which is the mechanism by which cancer very often spreads to distant organs and leads to mortality or death. So most melanomas, though not all, do sort of spend a little bit of time in what's called a superficial spreading phase, which is a phase where you would notice maybe, you know, clinically a change in the border, the color or the size of the lesion. And at that stage, the lesion is sort of changing in the upper layers of the skin. At some point, and this can be weeks to months or years, it is so variable. I mean, I wish that, that we could be better at predicting which lesions are gonna change quicker. But at some point, that lesion will enter a vertical growth phase, which means it's gonna start growing in depth. And as soon as it attains a little bit of depth, it will have access to blood vessels and lymphatics, and it can spread elsewhere. If we catch it early, we catch it before the lesion can kill the patient. And if we don't, it can really be deadly. Wonderful. Thank you so much again, Dr. Karen, for this very informative session. This concludes our final session of the January Ask the Expert series presented by DermTech. If you are looking for more resources, please visit the MRF's educational resource page on our website at melanoma.org. Again, on behalf of the entire team at the Melanoma Research Foundation, thank you to our wonderful partners at DermTech for bringing the expertise of top dermatologists like Dr. Karen to our community. We are so grateful for their support and are thrilled to announce that DermTech will be partnering with the MRF again for another Ask the Expert series this May, which is also Melanoma Awareness Month. Stay tuned for more information and we will see you all then. Stay safe and thank you for watching. Thank you.